Um, this session, Richard's going to be talking to us about um, essentially containerizing Docker, uh, containerizing data science, uh, containerizing Jupyter notebooks to kind of make reproducible data science. Hello. Good. Cool. And Richard, I'll leave you to introduce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Hello, um, good morning, it's still morning, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, um, let's get started then. Um, my, my name is Richard, Richard Akon, I'm from Ghana and I'll be talking about reproducible data science with Docker. Um, so, who am I? Um, I work as a machine learning engineer for a company in Ghana. We build um, marketing tools for um, e-commerce companies, small, medium-sized businesses, yeah. And I am the co-organizer of the Accra Artificial Intelligence Meetup. We meet every um, weekend and also in my free time, I write for Analytics Video and then Divio. Um, Divio is the company that builds Django CMS. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, before I continue, um, how many of us are data scientists, if you can show by your hands? And um, how many of us have used Docker in our process? Exciting. Wow, quite a number of people. Okay. Um, so, Basically, what I'm going to talk about is um, what reproducible data science is, and then why it's important, and then why we, like, why, why in our data science process we need reproducibility, and then how do we achieve that using Docker. So, I'll have a very short presentation, and then there will be, um, sorry. Yeah. And then there will be a very, shot demo using Docker to um, reproduce a data science environment and then also to reproduce some code or some analysis that somebody has already done. Yeah, okay. So, all right. So, basically what's reproducible data science or what's reprodu reproducibility um, is, is uh, the ability to rep replicate data science results. So, wow, this thing is not working for me, wow. I hope it doesn't mess up again. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, yeah, so basically, um, reproducible data science or reproducibility is the ability to sort of replicate data science results um, using the same data, using like similar environments, and then to be able to get the same results, right? And um, that Quite okay, I can sort of say that there are two cases where we do reproducible data science, and then like, so there's reproducibility in terms of doing research, and then when it comes to working in industry and then trying to build products for ourselves, right? So my presentation is mostly focused on um, doing data science in the industry or having like data that you do some analysis on it and then getting everybody in your company to sort of collaborate on it, right? Yeah. So. Why, why is re reproducibility important? Um, Karl Popper said that non-reproducible single occurrences are of no significance to science, and that's true because so if you are able to do, get some data, do some analysis on it, right, and then you are the only one that can get the same results. Every time you pass on that analysis, everybody seems to be getting different results, or if you are if you say that you found something interesting in some data, but then you are the only one who can sort of do it, and then even you yourself, you were able to do it one time, like it, it makes, it's of no use to anybody, to your clients, to your company, or anybody that um, is going to be using your product or your analysis. So, reproducibility is important because it forms the basis of a proof of a phenomenon, right? So, Client comes to you and then he tells you that, oh, um, I have 
this amount of data, I want you to look at it and find something interesting for me. Right? You do some analysis on the data and then you're able to realize that, well, maybe something interesting is happening here, something is happening with your um, revenue, something is happening with your, um, say, your employees, this is how much time they are spending doing that, this is how much time they are spending doing something, right? And if you're not able to reproduce that result, say in front of your customer, how, is, how are you able to prove that fact that um, this is actually what is happening, right? So if it's a one-time thing, then it makes no sense to everybody. Um, it also facilitates peer review. So it's important that as data scientists, we can also um, get, re get our work reviewed so if you are able to do some analysis, you might want your coworker or your colleague to go through the analysis and then see if there's something you're missing or something you did that doesn't totally make a lot of sense. And so it's important that for your coworker to be able to review your work, they have to be able to sort of replicate everything that you have done on their machine. So another case where reproducibility becomes important is in cases of peer review, and then um, basis of decision making. Data science is known or has become very, um, very popular because of the benefits that we are able to make decisions based on data, not based on our own intuitions or whatever we think, how we feel. And so if you are going to tell me or tell your client to make some particular decision, and then you can't back that with some analysis or the analysis you made cannot be reproduced, then how do you expect your clients to have faith in the analysis that you've been able to do? Right. Yeah, so these are some of the reasons why reproducibility in data science is important. And um, where, where, where do we need reproducibility? So like I was talking about, um, in we as data scientists working in industry, um, we mostly work with um, client data or you have data that belongs to your company and then you write some code to do some analysis and then you either pass it on for other people to review it, you build a model with it, whatever it is. Yeah, so we need to be able to, um, sorry, uh, we, we, we need to be able to reproduce data. So if you do some analysis with some data, right, and then you give the, or you give your findings to your colleague to review it. They also have to be able to take the same data and then use it. it you don't expect them to be using um, different forms of the data that you used in your analysis because there's a chance that you could produce different results. Right? And then in the environments that we use, so we, we are here at PyCon and so I'm assuming that we all, almost all the time use Python to in our daily works, right? So you're using Python and then different libraries of Python, you're using a different operating system, you're using, like, there are quite a number of things that form the basis of the environments that you are making your analysis in, right? And so it's important to be able to replicate that environment because if the library should change, if the um, operating system you're using is affected by the analysis you are doing, then there's a chance that if your colleague or anybody else that is going to run your analysis has a different environment co compared to yours, then there's a chance that they could get different results, right? So we need to be able to reproduce that environment. And then in the code that we write, if you write code on your machine and I run it on my machine and it doesn't work, then how are we going to be able to reproduce the results that we're talking about? Yeah, so these are the three um, places that we mostly care about when we are talking about reproducibility in data science. Um, working with data is quite, get, getting data or using the same data that was used in some analysis is sometimes quite easy in, um, uh, how, in industry because like, you, you get data already from there's, there's a chance that you already have data sitting on some server somewhere that you can sort of pull onto your local machine, or even sometimes we don't even have as big as data as we might think we have, and so you have like a few megabytes of data with 
a million, uh, about a million rows, right? And you do some analysis on it, and that's something you can move from your machine to another machine, and so that's easy to move about. But then the challenge, or what I'm going to focus my um, demo on, is the environment and then replicating code. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, excuse me for this. Um, so how do we achieve reproducibility? Um, so very often we have a data science workflow that is like as basic as this. We data scientists love their Jupyter notebooks. And so we have some data. We do some analysis in our Jupyter notebooks, right? And then we know about virtual environments and then how they allow us to keep up or keep our dependencies separate from other projects. And so you use some virtual environments, and then you do pip freeze, and then you get your requirements.txt file, right? So if you want somebody to replicate the results that you're talking about, you give them the notebook. You say, OK, this is my notebook. This is the analysis I made. This is the data. And then that's a requirement.txt file. You can also run it on your machine. But most of the times, this is what happens. So you, you you give your colleague the data, your notebook file, and then the requirements of TXT, they install everything, and then, but they still run their application and then they get something like this, right? So in, in the first hour, you can see that there's a chance that you have a different version of Python and then the person is, who is running your code also has a different version of Python. And so just mostly Python 2 to Python 3, it causes this problem, right? So you fix this, you run it again, and then you get to the next error. Your train data cannot be found. This is something that could happen because if you have your training data in the same location as where your notebook file is, but then when you are transferring the data to your colleague, you put it in a notebook or in a folder, right? So they run this, and then it happens. This is some of these are problems that could be solved easily, but then there are others so that could take you quite a lot of time to be able to just replicate the environments to be able to run the analysis you're talking about. And then there is this. Like, so the point I'm trying to make is it's using um, virtual environments are useful in some cases, but then there are still quite a number of challenges that come with virtual environments and their ability to reproduce the environments that we're talking about. So, um, how do we solve these challenges? That's the use of Docker. So Docker basically is um, a tool that allows you to like, create, deploy, and then run applications in containers. And um, containers are um, like a technology for virtualization. So they allow you to package your applications and all the dependencies, all the libraries, everything that you need to run the application into an image and or in, into a container. So a container contains everything that you need to be able to run the application, right? And Docker is a tool that uses that container technology to allow us to be able to do that. Right. Okay, so the basic or the workflow for Docker applications mostly exists like this. You have some code and then you create a Docker file, you build an image, you push that image to Docker registry, and then that anybody anywhere can pull that image. Um, I apologize if the image is not very clear, but you pull that image, and then you can run that image to get to your container. Right? And then you can have multiple containers running on the same machine, and they would have no effect on each other. Right? So, it's this idea that we want to use to be able to sort of replicate the results because if we have, if we are able to package our data, package our analysis, and then there are like environments and all, everything we need to run our analysis in a Docker image, then we can just pass that image to anybody or we can push that image to a Docker registry or Docker hub and then get anybody to pull that image and then run it on your machine, so far as they have Docker running on their machines. Yeah. So, what I'm going to do here is not to explain or teach you how to learn. I'm not going to like, take you through a basic 
Docker class. No, that's not what I'm going to do. But then I'm going to show you how like, Docker can be used to replicate results or replicate um, environments. And so if, if you're interested, you can just, it's, it's very easy to get Docker installed and, and get, um, learn the very few basic commands that can help you get up and running with Docker. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, I'm going to show you the demo now. Um, okay, so how many of us also use TensorFlow in our work? Um, have you installed TensorFlow on a GPU machine? Have you tried that? <laughs> Was it fun? It's not. I've, I've done, I've tried it more than three times, and every time it took me over an hour to do it. It's, so, if, if you want to install TensorFlow on a GPU machine, boy. Um, excuse me. Okay, um, I think this works. So, if you want to install um, TensorFlow on TensorFlow with GPU support, this is what you have to go through. Right? You have to make sure that all the requirements down there are installed. And if I should open the stages or the process you have to go through to get these requirements installed, you, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how tedious it is to get TensorFlow running in on a GPU machine. And then if you are doing some deep learning that you have, like, you, you, just, you, don't want enough, you don't want to use as much service as you can. You just want your local machine that has GPU support to just give you some boost, right? And if you have to go through this to um, replicate your, to do your analysis, then it, it doesn't help. Right, so, we, TensorFlow allows you to um, use Docker. So, TensorFlow has created the whole TensorFlow environment and everything you need to run TensorFlow. All you need is the driver on your GPU driver installed on your local machine. That's it. So, you just put the TensorFlow image, you run it, and then you're able to do your analysis. Right? So, I am going to... I have no idea why this thing is not working. Well, no, this is. Um, we can see that, right? So, like I said, Docker allows you to build images with everything you have in it, right? And then you upload that image to Docker Hub. So in this case, TensorFlow has built the TensorFlow environments with the versions of TensorFlow that you want. If you want GPE, if you want Python 3, everything in, a, in an image. And then we're going to pull that image, right? But um, I didn't know how fast the internet would be over here. So I decided to download the images and everything before I came. So it's going to be pretty fast. But then it takes quite a while, depending on your internet speed, to get the images downloaded. So, a basic command is to, wow, I hope everything goes well now. <laughs> yeah, so you can do docker pull and then say, nope, not. TensorFlow. And then say we want TensorFlow version 1.9, right? So that is the tag that has been added to it, then we want GPU support, and then we want Python 3, right? Um, this is the name TensorFlow has decided to give to their image, and so you don't have to name it this way, but then if you, you can have your own conventions for naming images, yeah. So, well. All right, so, um, Oh, I'm not connected to the internet. 
So it's supposed to try connecting to Docker registry, right? And then if you have the image on your local machine, it's going to tell you that, oh, you already have the image on your local machine, and so it's going to skip the downloading part. But I'm not connected to the internet, so. Um, but we can see that you can do Docker images to check the images that you have in your local machine. And over here, we can see we have TensorFlow 1.9 with GPU and then Python 3, right? Yeah. So this is the image that we are going to use to build a TensorFlow environment. Right? Yeah. So we can do Docker run, um, see, and then we specify a port that we want, um, say, AD, AD. So we are doing this because um, the TensorFlow image exposes um, a Jupyter Notebook file that we can use. So it opens up Jupyter Notebook for you to do your analysis in, and then it has everything you want in it. You can also decide to use this image as a basis for your personal image, and so you don't have to use the Jupyter Notebook. So, but this is easy to sort of show you what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, and then, we, so we want to, we also want to have the analysis being done on our local machine, right? So we, we want the Jupyter Notebooks that we are going to perform some analysis in. We want to have that image on the local machine and then we don't want to do it in the container itself. So we can specify a volume and mount that volume at say, and then set that as our working directory. So then the image we want to run So we've run Jupyter Notebooks before, right? It gives you um, a URL that you can use to yeah. So we decided to use AT80, port AT80. And then sorry, I have a local host. Yeah, um Sorry for, so, okay, we can have local hosts for AD, AD. All right, and so we have Jupyter Notebooks open, and from here we can create um, a Python 3 notebook and say, oh, actually, this is going to give an error. Because for you to be able to replicate um, TensorFlow GP with GPU support, you have to use NVIDIA Docker, or you have to set the Docker runtime to NVIDIA to be able to use the GPU. And so if you import TensorFlow with GPU support, it's going to, tell, it's going to give you this error. So that's quite an easy problem to fix. Yeah, so it's 
sorry. Yeah, live demos are quite difficult to pull up. So um, I'm going to copy this. So we can open our notebook, and then we can import TensorFlow. And we can say TensorFlow dot version. Right. So we can see that we have TensorFlow running on our machine, and we didn't have to go through the whole process of installing CUDA, installing CD, and, and, and all other things that we needed. Um, I'm out of time, so the next, I still have five minutes, right? Yeah, thank you. So the next part of the presentation is to sort of show you how you can use um, Docker to sort of replicate results that has been done. And so this is um, a GitHub um, repo that has, that has different data sets that they're using to tell stories using Jupyter notebooks, right? And then we, I am very interested in education. And so they have given you an environment that you can use to run the same analysis that they have. So with all the dependencies and everything in it, you can build this, you can pull this Docker image and run it, and then every analysis that they have done in there, and then you can see that they did this a year ago, right? Imagine running code that you wrote a year ago. See what happens. So it's. We, so I'm going to show you how to replicate this education results or the education analysis and get the same results that they got. Um, I'll try to do it really quickly, so yeah. Yes. So we can, we have the context image. We, we already have their image, right? And so we can just, so I don't have to type so many things. I already have, I've pulled the image. So they, ha they have their image named context lab storytelling with data. You pull that image and then you can run that image with this command here. Basically what the command is saying is, run the image, expose it on port 9999, and then name the container storytelling, right? And so we, we can have that. Yes, and we, we are saying that make it interactive. So when you open a Docker container, you can enter the container and then run commands in the container like you would be doing on your local machine, right? So over there we can say open Jupyter Notebooks. Oh, actually. Exits. Um, we. Yeah. Yeah, so. The image is already running, so we can close. Yeah, and then we can run it again. So now we can open Jupyter Notebooks and then expose it on port. Let's just um, we can just copy it and run it to save time. Yeah. So now we have 
this address that we can use to open a new notebook. using, let me see, yeah, so mount, we can go to mount and we can have education somewhere. Oh, so <laughs> I mounted my local, wow, this is interesting. But then, so not to, so as not to waste time, um, basically what it's saying here is you want to mount, so the command says mount your desktop, and then I needed to mount my current, my working directory, so I had to change this um, slash desktop into print working directory to be able to replicate the same results. But um, basically what I do is after every talk, I write a blog about it. And so you can have everything in there and then you can sort of run it yourself if you want to. Um, so I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Richard. A round of applause for Richard. Any so yeah, we're going to take some questions now. Um, I thought I'd kick off with something. So I saw actually a very cool uh, GitHub library called Binder. Um, and essentially what it does is for any GitHub repository which has a requirements um, file, yeah. it will generate a Docker image for that repository so that you can then um, essentially publish, that you, you know, yeah. publish the Docker image. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's quite amazing, right? If you can have requirements.txt file, build an image out for it, so that you don't have to go through the process of installing everything yourself. That's interesting, yeah. Cool, so I'm going to open up to the floor. Uh, first question, anyone? Yeah. Hey, um, I just wanted to know uh, um, how well do Docker images, I know you can orchestrate them through like a Kubernetes service, but how well do they communicate with each other if they're not managed through like a service management application? Um, yeah, so Docker Compose, you, uh, you can use Docker Compose to sort of manage different services and then specify a network on which you can have the different containers on. So yeah, Docker Compose is something you can use. Another question? So there's, you could say, like, even, even with Docker, there's yeah. still, like, a little bit of cumbersomeness that happens. Is there space for a package that helps you wrap, like, silly, silly things, like the, the port forwarding? Like, I feel like we need to automate that easily with, I don't know, there must be some sort of package that we can build to do that, or Jupyter could do support for it or something, just to make it super, super, super easy, because it's still, like, a little annoying things that Jupyter does um, yeah. that are just annoying. So I feel like there is space to handle, like, a bunch of this to make the steps even easier. Yeah, so I think, I, I don't know if, if scripts can, so if the person who made this ripple decided to write a script to run all these commands for you, then you just have to run that script. You don't have to go through the process of specifying ports and doing everything yourself. So, yes. Yes. Cool. Um, is there a last question? Hi, I'm, I'm just interested in knowing uh, which is better. Is it um, Nigerian jollof rice or <laughs> Ghanaian jollof rice? Uh, well, it's Ghanaian, of course. It's, 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 there's no debate on that. Nigerian jollof, t it tastes funny. 
<laughs> it, it, does. It, it does. It does. Cool, guys. Um, we're going to take five minutes just to switch over to our next speaker, Sarah. Uh, get up, stretch, but don't. I think don't leave the room, otherwise we're going to have delays. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.